Detroit Lions quarterback Jared Goff posted this earlier today. Thank you to the entire city of Los Angeles for welcoming a 21-year-old kid with open arms and making this town feel like home. The city is shit. The man I've become, and I will forever be grateful for the Cronky family, at him. my coaches, the support staff, and most importantly, my teammates for competing and fighting with me every Sunday. I've made memories with every one of you that locker room in that locker room that I will cherish for the rest of my life. Uh, to the fans, thank you for your support, blah, blah, blah. Ups and downs. Met the world of me. Bottom of my heart. Honored to represent the city of LA. I'm trying to move to do this fast. Uh, what up, go? Next chapter. And I am ready to attack this new opportunity that lies ahead. Detroit, here I come. He should have ended it with what up, though. I want to also right. point out what he said to, Lo to the Los Angeles Times. He said, ultimately, they wanted to go in a different direction. As the quarterback, as the guy that's at arguably the most important position on the field, if you're in a place that you're not wanted and they want to move on from you, well, hell, the feeling's mutual. Emphasis mine. Get out of that relationship. You don't want to be in the wrong Get out of that place. Thing. It became increasingly clear that was the case. The trade is something that I'm hopeful is going to be so good for my career. And as usual, for all things Jared Goff, we turn now to our resident Jared Goff <laughs> correspondent, How could political you? scientist, oh, that's Jason Johnson. Jason Johnson. <laughs> We okay, don't come to Jason that's Johnson for what's yeah, it is a it is a dope shirt. Like he, I mean, he come on, man. steps up every time. You say right. your best shirt. How could you not? I love how it. could you not love <laughs> Jared Goff? I mean, they, they can throw those words, such beautiful words. Look, and look, I didn't mean to run him out of town. Like I show up here, <laughs> I'm talking, and now he's gone. That was not my plan. I I'm never trying to cost nobody a job. I feel very, very bad about that. I feel very bad. Uh, but I will say no, this. You don't. No, you don't. Wonderful as a Seahawks man because Do Pat you? Stafford is terrible, and they're going to discover how terrible. Oh man! I'm so happy. They think they got Ryan Tannehill, and they really got Sam Bradford, and that's what we're going to see next season. I cannot wait to see Sean McVay fall on his genius rump. When he's got Matt Stafford there getting hurt in the pocket because he's no better in a clean pocket than Jared Goff is when he has to face real defenses, not that wow. Swiss cheese not out of Green Bay that he's been facing for 13 years. I'm thrilled. Couldn't be happier. You, wait a minute. This is you don't unbelievable. Think they upgraded? You don't think they clearly upgraded? No! This is not an upgrade. This is a lateral move with an older guy who has a greater tendency to get hurt than Jared Goff. There is absolutely oh my no God. upgrade in this. He's one of the so toughest ever. quarterbacks this in the like, league. Even when he gets first, Sizzler he still stays in the game. Okay? Sizzler the Ponderosa. That's not an upgrade. Your parents still <laughs> try to feed you. There's nothing, there's nothing good about this. I, I don't know. I, I mean, and, and basically, usually you got to go to Detroit to get robbed. They went to L.A., robbed somebody, <laughs> took it back home. <laughs> See? Hey, man. man. Look, you've been working on this stuff. I, hey, I, I, I just want to point out. I'm going to tell people. Let me tell people. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm going to tell people. I mean, the trade was like 35 seconds old. You're sending a text to me and Smith I, talking I about, about him. him. I didn't even know about right. it. I didn't even know about it. It's like you have Jared Goff alerts on your phone. I didn't even know about it. I'm I mean, like, wait, what? As soon as the trade, <laughs> I, you broke it. You broke the trade story, didn't you? <laughs> to us, you did. Yes, you, you broke it to us. I mean, they, he, he broke it over. You beat Mike Florio, everybody else. <laughs> I think his team reached out to me and said, there, you happy? I think that's actually a text I got from his agent. Like, that must have, must have been what happened. But, so, but I'm, I'm so, so just... Paul, Go ahead. You were saying? So, I, no, I'm no, telling no, you, this is, this is not a good look. It's not a good look for the Rams. It's not going to be a successful move for the Rams. It's not going to be the kind of thing that's going to make a difference for them. This does not end up making them... Uh, this does not end up making them a championship contender. Anybody who thinks that is incredibly naive. And I'm going to tell you all this. And, and I look. I beg I, your I, pardon. I, can tell you this. Uh, <laughs> I, I, look, I mean, I anybody like I do. I, I thought it was a good I, I, trade. <laughs> no, it's a terrible trade. It's a terrible trade under all circumstances. And, and here's the thing. I get it. Everybody's like, oh, oh, uh, uh, the Rams and Cronky and McVay, and they're going to be aggressive, et cetera, et cetera. We all know. In the NFL, it's 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 just like the it's just like baseball, it's just like basketball. There's only a certain number of teams that are ever really going to be championship contenders, and it has to do with a lot of luck and a lot of different circumstances. And quite frankly, having either a great pitcher, a great single player like LeBron, or a great quarterback. Matt Stafford is not a great quarterback. 
we have 13 years to see he's not a great quarterback. You can't blame your circumstances. You can't blame your circumstances when you've been mediocre for 13 straight years. It's Detroit, right? man. It's Detroit. It's it Detroit. doesn't matter. Okay. It doesn't matter. All right. He, he, right. he called well as his coach. Um, I mean, this is great. We, we got all I mean? this on tape. We got all this on tape for, <laughs> I, for down the road. And next year, and next year, when the Rams go 10 and 6 and make the playoffs in the expanded playoffs and end up losing to somebody, I'm going to say the same thing. And that's if Matt Stafford actually plays all 17 games. By the way, this is a guy who's injury prone, and next year the season extends by another game with no bye week. I don't, Why are you saying he's injury is... prone? He plays through all these injuries. No, no he, I was going to say, he are, plays. He may get hurt, getting this from. but he plays a lot. Getting this from. I know he missed... Like, he missed like, like, nine, like, ten straight games last like, year. Like, okay, in yeah. 2019, he, he played in eight games. He, has, play, he yes. has played in and started in all 16 games since 2011, with the exception of 2019. Where are you getting this we from? we got to look at the curve. He's 33 years old, y'all. If you missed half no, the season he, last no, year. No. Then... You said he was injury prone. I'm looking He's at facts prone. here. He doesn't that miss. Be, okay, well, he doesn't miss games if he is hurt. That to me, if you if staying healthy is part of your skill set, he missed half a season in 2019. He will be facing tougher defenses in this division. He's not going okay. to stay upright. You got a division All where right. they're used to chasing Russell. They're used to chasing Kyler. They're used to knocking Jimmy Garoppolo on his rear end. <laughs> although he's going to be he's going to be a, he's going to be on the on the Patriots by next year. That's what's going to happen there. But look, Maybe. I'm telling you all, this is not going to be an upgrade. They ain't making no all Super right. Bowl. They ain't making no Super Bowl. Like, hey. that. I will we, eat we my got Seahawks. I will eat my T-shirt. The Seahawks no, need to put him on the payroll. They didn't put I'm him on the payroll. You, I'm telling you. Like, they, you, you he should have. He should have. He should have hung the 12th man banner long ago yeah. by now. I'm, um, I'm just. We got to get. I'm stating facts. I'm stating facts. We this got not, so look, much this news. This is Kirk Cousins. Of, this is Kirk Cousins. It's not. Oh it's not good. <laughs> we got so much political news to get to, but I do have to get this from you though, because we also have you on tape. Basically saying how the Nets are going to be a train wreck. Did you people last <laughs> night against the Clippers? Did you people? I just want to just real I quick. May I may have need you to acknowledge a that. little bit of a game last night where they actually beat the Clippers. And that Don't would be meaningful to me, okay, if there were not an icebox where the Clippers' hearts used to be, right? They ain't got no heart. <laughs> they ain't never been a tough team. They ain't never been a real team. So anybody beating the Clippers in February, what does that mean? The Clippers are gonna fade down the stretch like they always do. Kawhi is gonna do his, his he's gonna do his silent treatment. Kawhi is gonna disappear. Uh, you know, Paul George is gonna be, you know, playoff P as he usually does, which is P for pathetic. So the Brooklyn Nets being able to beat them at this time of the year doesn't mean anything. And they gave up, I do believe, I think the Clippers are actually still scoring now, right? Like they give up 8,000 points in a game. Can't do that in the playoffs. And LeBron, LeBron and the Lakers aren't worried about that because they're gonna be in the same building. All you gotta do is keep the game hundred under 137 points. Basically, if you keep the clip, if you keep the Nets from scoring like an all-star game, you're gonna win. And the Clippers got no heart. <laughs> All right. Oh man, you like you got bars today. Jason Johnson <laughs> has that. Native that's what tongue. I should have put. I should have put that in the feed. Jason Johnson has bars. <laughs> That's it. I, I'm just, I, I watch, I, it's funny, I watch that game in particular because I want, I was like, hey, let me watch them also play together. And, and I heard what you guys were saying earlier about like, look, you know, they're, they're entertaining to watch, they're enjoyable to watch. It reminds me of like watching the Phoenix Suns or watching my, mm -hmm. my first favorite team of all time, uh, which was the Sacramento Kings. And I think even mm -hmm. the Kings, because they have Bibby and they, and they have Bobby Jackson, you know, and they had Doug Christie, even the Kings, they had somebody on that team with heart. I don't, I don't really think there's anybody on the Nets who's got heart. And I know there ain't nobody on the Clippers who's got heart. Nobody. I think Luka's got more heart than anybody on the Clippers right now. Man. And I don't like Okay. Takes. <laughs> I just say, I right. love the fire. We, we, let, let, let's, 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 talk let's, get some, let's get to something you actually know something about. Michael, <laughs> go ahead. Let's get, <laughs> let's get to his area of expertise. <laughs> no, I, I want to I get your... Uh, I want to get your take in general, just just your general mm -hmm. thoughts on this, because I know we talked about it on inauguration day, where right. Joe Biden is talking about in his speech unity, unity, unity. And we're all like, "Come on, yeah. come on, Joe, I, are are you just saying that?" But we know a lot yeah. of presidents, when they first, I know he's been in the White House before as vice president, but a lot of these guys, the reason they go gray and lose weight is they get there and they figure they figure out the enormity 
yeah. of the job, things that we know and things that we don't know. So Joe Biden, do you think he, based on the information that he's gotten so far in office, do you think he is still um, hopeful that yeah. his unity statement is even possible? Uh, honestly, Holly, I don't know that he ever believed it. And, and the reason I think that is because some of the moves I've seen Joe Biden make, I, and you guys heard me say this, I was always concerned that Biden was going to be naive. He was going to be like, well, I used to play squash with these guys in 1992. We can all, we can kick it. We can make things happen. And I think what he's done since he's gotten into office is basically said, all right, look, here's the door, right? You can either work with me or you can go to the door. He, he fired uh, you know, he, he fired the sort of Trumpists at the National Labor Relations Board. Uh, his new um, uh, Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, has basically gotten rid of all the Trumpists that were added to national security in like the last four or five days. Joe Biden has come into office and been cleaning house, kicked down the floor, waving a 4 4. Like that's what he's done since he got <laughs> in. And that suggests to me <laughs> that he understands that these aren't people that you can work with. So they can chat, chat, chat all they want about, about unity and working together. But as long as we still have to pushing for policy, it seems to be a good idea. They're going to push through this nineteen, this $1.9 billion in COVID relief right now uh, by basically doing reconciliation, which means you don't have to get 60 votes. You can ignore all the Republicans. That's how you're supposed to operate when you have a mandate, play like you got a mandate. Yeah. And, and Joe Biden last night at a memorial for Officer Brian uh, Sicknick, who was killed by Donald Trump and white supremacy. Like, I just, I'm watching yeah. that last night, and I'm just like, that's all some old bull. That's all some BS. Like, I mean, like he, he's, he's oh, yeah. th this man is lying in honor in the rotunda at the Capitol based on a lie. Not that not that death or, 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 or murder or, or, or war even ever makes sense. But, like, if there, if there was ever the definition of a senseless death is what we yeah. saw last night. Meanwhile, as Donald Trump and his lawyers, because he always finds some lawyers to, to, to subscribe to his whack job theories or conspiracy theories. Jason, I just want you to explain this to me, and I mean this rhetorical, rhetorically. Excuse mm. me. <laughs> Can you explain to me what it means that the president therefore denies that his... Uh, beliefs that the election results were suspect. How can you deny that something is false? That, I mean, like, people like legal people, they actually wrote this. He denies that that's false. Like, can you make that make sense for me, please? It, this is my, this is why he had like a whole raft of lawyers quit five days before he was even supposed to go to impeachment. I mean, when you can't yeah. find a lawyer who's willing to take a huge amount of money and represent the president of the United States, including like, uh, you know, lawyers, I think it was Butch, uh, Butch Bowen uh, from South Carolina, who's represented Nikki Haley and, and, and Mark Sanford, all sorts of other people who've been in shady nonsense. When you get lawyers who are like, nah, man, this is too crazy even for me, um, it's indicative of, of how insane the president's behavior is. But here's the other thing, and, and I think this is key, whether you're talking about the, the influence of the riot or what's been happening since. I think we also have to recognize that the Republican Party, like I said, has basically become a front store for, for a terrorist organization. That, that's what they've become at this particular point. And while Donald Trump may have at one point been the leader of this terrorist organization, you now have all sorts of members of Congress who are running around playing their version of Starscream saying, I'm the next person to take over and be leader. And that's the damage <laughs> yeah. that we're seeing right now, that these people are all pretending they want to take the glass, they want to take the ring and continue this nonsense. So I, I'm, I'm going to be covering the impeachment all next week on MSNBC. Yeah. And I'm going to be writing about it. What I'm looking for is not the arguments that Trump's lawyers are going to make. What I'm looking for is the disingenuous nonsense that's going to come out of Republicans' mouths to rationalize or justify an assault that left, you know, Katie yeah. Porter, Adana Presley, and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez yeah, Trump. Yeah. yeah. No, and, and just a quick follow-up on that. It's, to your point, uh, I saw you uh, on IG Live with our friend Tiffany Cross this morning. Yes. And the, <laughs> the, 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 per the person at the front of the line, I love the, 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 the uh, Transformers reference just now. Same. Star screen right now is, is Marjorie Taylor Greene right now, who is yes. voting on tomorrow to remove her from her committee appointments. I love right. what you said about on, on Tiffany's IG Live about not wanting to give her too much attention and you, I'll yeah. let you say it for yourself. Not want to give her too much attention. The bad apple thing. Um, although yeah. I do like how it allows Republicans to expose themselves for who they are 
to the point you just made yes. a second ago, but but take it away. Yeah, because basically what Marjorie Taylor Greene becomes like Daniel Holdsclaw. You guys remember Daniel Holdsclaw? So he was the no. cop who was he was a cop in Oklahoma City uh, who was busted about five or six years ago for targeting and sexually assaulting black women. And he was a serial mm. rapist uh, who was eventually caught. It, it, you know, it was a story that I, I, I wrote about and covered. We're trying to bring a lot more national attention to it. But this guy was going, as a police officer, targeting African-American women, sexually assaulting them, and then covering it up in his reports. And he finally got busted. Even the police department uh, basically switched on this guy. And they're like, yeah, we got to go. He's got to go to jail. But the issue, the reason I use that example is they kept trying to say he was a bad apple and not expose the fact that for him to get away with what he was doing for so long required complicity or at least uh, tacit knowledge of so many other people in that police department. They all needed to be held accountable. That whole department needed to be abolished after allowing something like that to happen for so long and taking so long to even complete the investigation. That is Marjorie Taylor Greene, okay? She is not an outlier. She just happens to be the one that everybody's paying attention to at this particular point. And the more that we talk about Marjorie Taylor Greene, that makes it easier for the Republicans to pretend that she's a weirdo, she's a bad apple, she's that one bad cop, and not investigate the rest of the department. Just same because she happens to be... Yeah, yeah, same as Trump. Trump. Same as Trump. Yeah. When I saw her, I'll be honest with you, I, I, I didn't know how busy she was because, you know, when you see people express that kind of attitude, I actually thought she was yelling at LeBron at that, that Hawks game. Um, she was like... <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, so Marjorie Taylor Greene, you know, let's not act like she's an outlier. Let's let, let the Republican Party and all the media focus on her and then say, oh, once she's gone, once she's off the committee, the problem is solved. Because you still have hundreds of Republicans that voted to overturn this election. You have hundreds of Republicans who still thought that Barack Obama was from Kenya. You have hundreds of Republicans who still want to work with these conspiracy theories. So we can't make her the focus. we got to keep the focus on that party that's Again, it's just a front for, for a criminal terrorist organization. All right. Well, to, to, the, to that end, outliers and not outliers, let's talk about Rochester, New York. Nine-year-old girl, pepper sprayed, handcuffed. Yeah. Are we talking about, oh, these officers just, uh, they were in a, a stressful situation. They feared for their lives. And, and, and they just didn't react properly? Or are we talking about, Jason, just a holy in competent, disgraceful department in Rochester. What, what's your take on that situation there? So I, I came to this conclusion last summer, and it was a long, long process, a long process, a lot of conversations, a lot of research. Um, I am on this. It's not something that I, I, I talk about these things in a larger context a lot. I'm in favor of sort of abolishing police departments, not defunding them. They need to be abolished because you can't reform some of this behavior. And that's essentially what you have here. The idea, so many steps and decisions have to be taken before you can pepper spray a nine-year-old girl. So many decisions and steps have to be taken before you can drag a family out of their car in a parking lot because you think the car might be stolen. You can't reform that behavior. You can't fire people for that behavior. You have to take the entire department, cancel it, smash it, and rebuild it from the beginning. I keep telling people, if you had a restaurant where everybody kept getting sick, right, And you can't just say, well, you know, all right, we got new management. No, tear down the restaurant. It'll still look like a pizza hut, but turn it into a Chinese food restaurant. You got to just change the whole place, right? That's what you have to do with these police departments because they're going to continue to abuse and kill black, brown, and poor people on a regular basis and then get off scot-free. And again, when I'm talking about abolishing a police department, I'm not just saying, oh, everybody gets fired. I'm saying you also hold people accountable for the behavior they engaged in when they were in that department. You know, you don't do, you don't pepper spray a nine-year-old girl unless you think you can get past that with your boss. You don't drag a right. whole family out and, and, and hold them at gunpoint in the middle of a mall parking lot if you don't think you can get past that with your boss. That's right. That, that's the problem. It was, that's right. It was instinctive. It was instinctive. Yeah. It was a it was a it was a default response. Oh, just spray already. We're cavalier about it. They're more interested in compliance yeah. than compassion. A couple of things yeah. I wanted to a uh, couple of votes. And, and going back to Congress for a second, talk about a front for a terrorist organization, or maybe you know part of terrorist organizations. When you consider two sixteen to two ten was the vote <laughs> for fines 
for flouting security screening. Okay, like like so after this attack, let's not yeah. let, let, let's have increased security. Two hundred and ten people, Republican, all, all every Republican is like, no, we don't want that. So that says it all right there. But I do want to focus though on the Senate organizing pact that Mitch McConnell and Chuck Schumer came to. Can you break that down a little bit more? Because on the surface, it seemed like, okay, Ossoff and Warnock are in, Kamala Harris is the deciding vote, bam. Senate's, Senate's a Democratic control. Not that simple. Can you kind of break down what today's uh, development represented? So, so the, the easiest way to, to understand this is that the minority party and the majority party um, they have to sort of get together and make agreements as to who runs what committee, who's on what committees, and who's on what subcommittee. And, and, and especially when you have a Senate that's split 50-50, it is something that usually comes through with a statute, and then you put people on these different kinds of committees. Mitch McConnell has been basically holding up the process, up until more or less today, of putting people on their proper committees one way or another. And if you don't change the committee leaders and the committee chairs, then you end up not being able to move most policy through. You can't get bills. You can't make bills into law. The other part about this, though, that I think people need to understand, and this goes back to, to Michael, what you said at the very, very beginning, you know, unity and working together, UNITY. No, there, there is none. We haven't had to have these kinds of negotiations between a majority and a minority party leader in decades. Because usually the party that loses is like, okay, just make sure that a couple of our senior senators end up still having chairmanships because seniority matters. No, you still got Mitch McConnell pushing and fighting to try to make sure that that, that Republicans essentially stay in leadership. You know, they, they put Raphael Warnock, okay, so they, they put us off on judiciary, it's great, they put Raphael Warnock in agriculture, but Mitch McConnell is still trying to operate as if he is, is, he is still leading the Senate, or at least that he should be a co-leader, and he's not because the Democrats actually have more votes. So that, that's what people need to understand. It's a reflection of the kind of obstructionism that we're going to see all the way through. It's not going to stop, which is why executive orders and things like that need to continue. And I, I, you know, I tell you guys, if there's one thing that I, I, I think has been somewhat beneficial in, in, in the, the last four or five terrible years of what we're facing now, I think the general level of civics understanding of Americans has skyrocketed. Like, we have, yeah. we have moved past... We have moved past, you know, schoolhouse rock and historia to a point where people are actually understanding these kinds of words and are like, oh, mm. wait a minute, this is obstructionism. This is where the committees matter. Because now I think when people start understanding how the government works, they can recognize who to blame. Word. Uh, uh, before we let you go, I'm just a bill and I'm sitting <laughs> here on Capitol <laughs> Hill. Uh, no, uh, I, I love that. Question. Uh, you have a great, yes. you have a great Cicely Tyson uh, picture in your background. Uh, let's talk yes. about Sister Cicely, and and what she meant to uh, the culture and what she meant to you. So this is the interesting thing, and I, I say this with with a tremendous amount of respect. Like Cicely Tyson has been like old my whole life, right? Like like she mm -hmm. always, and she's, right. she's one of those actresses that like you always thought she was going to be there, right? I, I, you know, I, I've rewatched Roots. I've seen several different films that she's in. I, I think in, in that, that video, I was, I was talking to a colleague of mine about this, that video of her in 1973, when she got played uh, from getting the Oscar for Sounder. And, and the absolute, if we had had gifts back then of her saying, of course, I'll give it to Liza Minnelli, blah, blah, blah. Like, she had a boldness about her position and her strength and her acting that is that sort of set, set the precedent for how Black actresses could operate in Hollywood. We, you know, Hollywood still operates on colorism, classism, and this is a black woman that looks like our families, that looks like our Aunt Viv, right? Who looks like somebody that we would all know, who was like, I'm going to respect myself, I'm going to take roles that are of meaning to me, and I'm going to continue to do that throughout my life. Um, and I, I found her to be amazing. It's interesting, I, I grabbed the book because basically all throughout Black History Month, I'm, I'm going to Black-owned bookstores, buying books for, for myself and for other people. I bought this for a, a good friend of mine. But, you know, I, I encourage people to spend the time to learn about what actresses like Cicely Tyson had to do to have careers this long, to, to be considered uh, people of substance. Because there are other people who have acted that long, but they aren't as revered as she is because they weren't out there. They weren't accessible. They weren't available uh, to drop jewels of knowledge to people as she was. And, you know, for her to pass, like, right after her autobiography is coming out is, is a trip.
Jules of knowledge is right when it comes to you, brother. It's always a pleasure to kick it with you every week. Thank you for your time. Kept you over today. Thank you uh, you want to give us your Super Bowl pick that's sure to be wrong? No, I'm just kidding. You want to give us a Super Bowl pick on the way out before we go to break? <laughs> I am slightly concerned because of the injuries on the O-line for the Kansas City Chiefs, but I think the Chiefs win 38-31 to 31 over the Buccaneers. Tom Brady does not okay. get his Super Bowl ring. That's my guess. All that's right. a good that's, game, that's, though. That's I, hope, I hope they can keep that's, it that close. Take it. I'm nervous, I, 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 I'm I, nervous I, about I, the Buccaneers. I, I'm, 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 you mean you nervous about them winning or nervous about them losing? Because Tom Brady... No, I'm, not, I'm nervous about them being able to... ...at a local Chinese food restaurant. Who has? I mean, he, he, I said Tom Brady was throwing more ducks at a local Chinese food restaurant at lunchtime <laughs> in the second half of that game. So I, I don't see any circumstance where he's going to be able to keep up with Kansas City without a lot of turnovers. I mean, he may he may end up scoring to Kansas City. You know how they do. They're like the old school Lakers. They sleep through the first quarter and a half. Um, but I still think, I think they're going to blow him away. And and Mahomes to the second ring and the baby goat takes over. Yeah, that's what I'm all saying. Right, I, I just hope, hope Tampa can hang in there. That's all. Hey, thanks for watching Brother from Another on YouTube. Make sure you hit subscribe before you leave and be sure to watch us 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern time on Peacock. Appreciate you.